Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. It is a good morning. Good morning. It is a good morning. Happy birthday to the other celebrants. Yeah, it, it doesn't make any difference. I know all of you have heard it, but may, no, not all of you, because some of you are real new to the program. I had one gal out there with eight days. And that is important. That is, she'll do it just the way we all do it, one day at a time. And that's the way you put together. I got sober in 1957. And that makes me, those of you who are familiar with my little jar of pearls, that makes me be able to put that 48th pearl. When I get home, I wanted to, I didn't want to put it in before I left here. My husband started this for me when I was about five years sober. He figured, well, maybe it's going to happen this time. (laughs) So he got this little pearl with five, this jar with five pearls in it. And each year, that's the only thing he'd do, make do on my birthday, because it just wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he was a great part of that sobriety, but he didn't go to AA with me or anything. He, he did what the traditions ask. He cooperated without affiliation. And girls, you might find that to be a, a factor in your life, cause maybe, you know, your significant other, your husband, might not want to join in because have you ever seen a, if you stay around long enough, you'll never see a room of Al-Anons crowded with men. Honey, it just isn't the nature of the beast. Now, we have a lot of men in Al-Anon, but not nearly as many as the spouses go. So, it doesn't have to, I figured I made my man miserable. If any of you want to get my story tape out there. It's pitiful what I did to that man, but, you know, I made him feel less than by requiring that he went to meetings with me. And he said no, and my military man, when he said no, he meant no, no in-between, no maybe, no we'll see, no. (laughs) You got a problem, you solve it. And that wasn't a cruel. With, With me, that's the way it had to be done. Because my good German blood is thicker than water right up here where the stubborn area goes. And I think God, my power power knew that if he made it too easy for me, I might not stay sober. So he, he gave me a stumbling block. And that's all right. It was up to me to get around it. Took a while. Nearly drove him crazy. But, you know, I finally hit the key as I talked about yesterday when I decided to do it that way if I possibly could. And when that sponsor said to me, Willie, you have to get your sense of humor back, instead of belly aching all the time about him drinking in front of you. He was a drinker, not an alcoholic. He was one of these that could come in from the flight line and he'd say, you know, let's have supper about 7 o'clock and I'm going to have a couple of drinks. Okay. See, I walked around just resenting and angry and roared at him, you know, how can you do this to me? Can you imagine how can he do this when I had put him through pure unmitigated hell for six or eight years? And how can you do this to me? Well, he'd fix up those drinks and he'd have two and it's seven o'clock. Here he came. And if he had that much left in his glass, he poured it down my sink. <laughs> Because it was 7 o'clock, don't you understand? And he had said he was going to eat at 7. That's the kind of man I was married to. Of course, I would watch that booze go all the way down the door. I cried a lot in those first couple of years of sobriety. So, honey, if you have a stumbling block of any kind, doesn't make any difference what it is, just ask your higher power not to remove the stumbling block. Just show you a way around it. And you'll be okay, too. 
because there's going to be stumbling blocks. Of course there is. Okay, I'm still with it for you people that have been here all weekend. I'm still an alcoholic. But it's it's so nice to be this fur piece from it of taking that last drink in Seattle, Washington. We were stationed there at the time, and I have a I enjoy my anniversaries because I have a chance to really f- flick back and see what these 48 years have meant in my life. And I told all yesterday my life hasn't turned out like I wanted it to or what how I had planned it. I figured my man and I would grow old together. And so here I am growing old by myself. And that's a stumbling block, but God has shown me a way around it. And a lot of times through you people, being with y'all, looking forward to being with y'all. This is a beautiful program. Just hang on to it if you, if even if your fingernails are just barely hanging on. Plant those feet and put one foot in front of the other. All right, we're going to do step 10 this morning, 10, 11, and 12, from the 12 and 12. We start on page 88. I sure wish there was more light up here. Our uh, principle in, in step 10 is perseverance. Keep on keeping on. We've lost this ability when our, we were drinking because the only thing we would keep on doing over and over was drinking. But as far as, as your sober life, when you, if you can put this principle into your thinking, oh, God, it, I don't care what happens. I'm going to do the very best I can to keep my attitude where I'm going to be ready for it. Just like I pay my insurance, even though maybe 15 years I haven't used my car insurance, I guess, in 20 years. But see, I, I pay the premiums. I pay them. I pay them. And it was equated to me that, you know, practicing these principles in all of our affairs daily, it's like insurance premiums. Because if if I pay those premiums when I do need them, and good Lord, it may be on Tuesday of next week down in Houston, I may need it, and it'll be there. It's aggravating to pay it time after time after time, and it's hard in your daily living to try to keep your attitude up to just a bare smidgen of these principles. But it's worth it, I promise you that. So that's our principle for step 10. Let's go in this together. Yo, thank you though. Anybody got a lantern? (laughs) Do we happen to have a seaman in the group? Yeah, doggone. Maybe Paul can help out now. I continued, continued to take that personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. What do you reckon my ring around word is there? Good, promptly. And it all, it also, I remember I was so proud one time. I had met my sponsor and for lunch that day, and I told her, I said, Rose, you're going to be so proud of me. You're going to be so proud. I snapped off a little girl at the cleaners because she couldn't find my cleaning, and I snapped her off yesterday, and I went back today and told her I was sorry. She said, you did what? (laughs) I told her, I said, I went back, and I was sort of crestfallen because she wasn't leaping for joy. I said, I told her I was sorry. She said, maybe we better read step 10 again. When you were wrong, promptly admitted it. Wrong there. Don't go back and say you're sorry. Because see, saying you're sorry, she explained to me, is so easy, Willie. It's so easy. And it is. We say we're sorry when we bump into anybody or even if we look like we're going to bump into them. We're going to walk in front of them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And that just rolls off here. But we don't like to admit we were wrong. There are some of you old enough to remember happy days and the Fonz. You remember how Fonz could not say, I was wrong, wrong, wrong. He could not get it out. 
because it's one of the hardest things to admit uh, to being wrong. Sorry, what? What? You sorry? Well, okay. Most people want to say back to you, yeah, I know you're pretty sorry. <laughs> but, but it doesn't mean anything. But saying you're wrong means something. And that's what she wanted me to understand. And so, <laughs> and honey, this is the, the step that you know, if you feel like you've been sober seven or eight years and you didn't do a complete inventory, this is a good time to just keep it up to date. And then it will not have to be debated all the time or gone back and done over because you're living a new life. Somebody asked me yesterday how old I was. I said, I'm 48. Because that's when the real meaning, I had been a happy kid and a happy teenager, happy college person. And I told y'all I loved the teaching that I did for 37 years. And But my life took on a meaning that I never even dreamed it could. Just personal meaning to me, which made me more valuable to my man and to my son when I had him. This step is so important, hon, to keep up. It's like emptying the garbage. If you store it in the corner, it sure will cause you problems. But if you empty it out each day or send somebody to do it for you, that's even better. <laughs> but you keep it clean with step 10. You keep each day, you know, okay, how did I do today? And when you need a little fussing at, then do it. Say, I didn't do so good. And see what you can do about it. But this is the, how, the other house cleaning step. But we do this daily instead of trying to do it, wait three or four days. And that promptly is important. You let me put off something and I, uh, somehow or another I just get so busy that I just never do do it. Okay, this to me is a attitude step to be able to be on to myself and catch on to myself and and keep abreast of the fact that okay Willie you're you're going to have to be careful every day to keep that balance that you want they're not asking us to do it all the time but just to tilt over but know when you're tilted I often wish there were bells like on the machines that we play and they go tilt I don't know. I don't know whether they still do that. Do they? Pinball machines? Okay, good. But if they just, you know, ring a bell and say tilt, then we could under. But to keep on this step ten, then we can recognize when we're tilting either way and try to straighten back up and get that balance. It says as we work the first nine steps, we prepare for the adventure ah, of a new life. And when we approach step 10, we commence to put our AA way of living to practical use day by day in fair weather and foul. Then comes the acid test. Can we stay sober, keep an emotional balance, and live to good purpose under all conditions? A continuous look at our assets and liabilities and a real desire to learn and grow by this means are necessities for us. We alcoholics have learned this the hard way. More experienced people, of course, in all times and places have practiced unsparing self-survey and criticism. We're going to get it. We learn to take it. For the wise have always known that no one can make much of his life until self-searching becomes a regular habit. And equating it to the garbage helped me. Until he is able to admit and accept what he finds, and until he patiently and persistently tries to correct what is wrong. See, it even gives us leeway there in the beginning. It's not going to be easy to just tell yourself you're wrong and then to tell whomever you need to tell if that was the case. But <clears throat> I know you've sat in meetings and you newcomers will sit in meetings and Maybe you're already sort of wondering about it, but you don't want to ask. When they say, I've been on a dry drunk, 
than you think a dry drunk. How can you be drunk and dry at the same time? And they forget to explain it to some of the newcomers, and maybe you'll take that as your own personal mission. If they use the word dry drunk and then start talking about all the other things, then maybe you can say, do you understand what a dry drunk is? And if they look sort of confused, tell them. On page 88 of the 12 and 12, we find out what a dry drunk is, and maybe this will help you. When a drunk has a terrific hangover because he drank heavily yesterday, he cannot live well today. But there's another kind of hangover which we all experience, whether we're drinking or not. This is the emotional hangover, which is the direct results of yesterday's and sometime today's excesses of negative emotions, anger, fear, jealousy, and the like. Excess of those. We're going to all experience them. When I'm tired and dragged out and everything, I use that as an excuse to be angry. I told you yesterday, I let it come and visit, but I don't let it unpack its suitcases and live there very long because I know how dangerous it is for me. To get angry is human. To take it to excess is a negative thing that we don't want to have in our lives just so I don't hang on to it too long. Any human being watching the news broadcast is going to get angry. Any of us. When we see some of the man's inhumanity to man, we, we're going to get angry. And that's okay. See, it's telling us now that <laughs> we're not ever going to get perfect at that unless we quit being human beings and turn into some... But scientists may do that to us one day. I don't know. But otherwise, we're going to get angry. We're going to get fearful. Life's going to make us jealous. There's not, you know, I've got to realize that even a little emotion, like when they announced the lottery winner, and it's not on my ticket. <laughs> I think that old boy didn't need the, you know, he didn't need this. And I don't need it either, but I could do so much good with it. <laughs> I could help so many people with this. And, you know, if it's a fun thing if I remember to poke fun at myself. And say, okay, Willie, what are you doing? You don't need that any more than you need a, you know, a bright red horse. If, <laughs> but we're going to, it doesn't, I don't want you to worry about it when you have these little, whoa, the program is not working. I'm not really doing what I'm supposed to do. No, just get over it real quick. That's your key. If we would live serenely today and tomorrow, we certainly need to eliminate these hangovers. And this doesn't mean that we need to wa um, wander morbidly around in the past. It requires an admission and correction of errors now. Our inventory enables us to settle with the past. When this is done, we're really able to leave it behind us. When our inventory is carefully taken and we have made peace with ourselves, the conviction follows that tomorrow's challenges can be met as they come. And that makes just plain old common sense, doesn't it? If I don't have to carry the woes and grievances of today on tomorrow, then I can start fresh in the morning, because really tomorrow never comes. Although all inventories are alike in principle, the same, the time factor does distinguish one from another. There's a spot check inventory, taken at any time of the day, whenever we found ourselves getting tangled up. I like that. Because sometimes we feel like, you know, we've got a hold of a smooth of thread, or you fellas have your fishing line there that you're trying to get, and you get that thing tangled up. The more tangled you get it, the harder you work on it, and the angrier you get. Sucker won't come undone, and you're in a hurry. And we do the same thing with a spool of thread. Tangled up, because sometimes we're not really in bad shape. We're just sort of what? What? What else is going to happen today? <laughs> and and that's tangled up is a good expression. There's the one that we take at days in when we review the happenings of the hours just passed. Here we cast up the balance sheet, crediting crediting ourselves with things well done and chalking up debits where due. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I, hey, I don't, I'm not supposed to give yourself any credit because if you do, you start bragging on yourself. 
No. If I can say, you know, Willie, you started out today to do that job and you got it done. Good girl. Because I'm walking around there, you know, with me. And I've got to know when I've set a goal and, and got it accomplished that I did a good job. And that, that's all right. That didn't, there isn't any ego involved. It was just between me and whatever job it was. Then there are those occasions when alone or in the company of our sponsor and spiritual advisor, we make a careful review of our progress since the last time. Many AAs go in for annual and semi-annual house cleanings. And Joe and Charlie in the big book tells us about that. In this chapter, we'll give a lot of good suggestions on how to take some quiet time. I have a quiet place where I go. I picked out one at the suggestion of of this book and, and the suggestions of the program as a whole to, to always have a quiet place. It's uh, sort of like a time out that we, you know, give our kids. I take my own time out and I go to the same place when I possibly can to do a, oh, a little extended survey on how are you doing. Nobody, a lot of times, no one would myself's there, but I learned to talk to myself pretty good and give myself honest answers. You've been sort of tangled up the last two or three days. Why don't you take care of it? And then really see the progress that's been made in my life and uh, the progress that was made in my son's life. He's the only one I have, and we had been married ten years before we had him, but he never saw his mother take a drink. And I have to... To really make that a part of my thinking. I don't even like to imagine what it'd been like. If you're fortunate enough to be, but if you, if your kids were around when you were drinking, that's alright. They'll be alright if you, because God's gonna take care of them. They're His kids too. Down the middle of that bottom paragraph, the emphasis on inventory is heavy only because a great many of us have never really acquired the habit of accurate self-appraisal. Once this healthy practice has become grooved, it'll be so interesting and profitable that the time it takes won't be missed. For these minutes and sometime hours spent in self-examination are bound, and bound, bound to make all the other hours of our day better and happier. That's a nice promise. And at length our inventories become a regular part of everyday living rather than something unusual or set aside. Skip the little one and go down to it's a spiritual axiom that every time we are disturbed, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with us. And now wait just a minute. <laughs> I read that statement and I said, wait, hold on here. You know, we I have a habit of, okay, I read that and then just, you know, looked up quarreling with it. Instead of going, I won't let kids do that in school skip a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't understand instead of going, I tell them, go on and read the rest of it. Then draw a conclusion. But oh no, I said, there's something wrong with me every time I get upset? That's not, that's not right. Look what it says. If somebody hurts us um, and we are sore, we're in the wrong also. But are there no exceptions to this rule? What about justifiable anger? If somebody cheats us, aren't we entitled to be mad? Can we properly ang can we be properly angry with self righteous folks? For us of AA, these are dangerous exceptions. We have found that justified anger ought to be left to those better qualified to handle it. I took offense to that one too. But then I realized what they were trying to say. See if somebody makes me mad and I react to it and do something dumb and not realize that maybe I had something to do with the fact that they're making me angry just to ponder it to try to stay in balance but instead a burst of temper here's what it's telling me a burst of temper could spoil a day and a well-nursed grudge could make us miserably ineffective nor were we ever skilled at separating justified from unjustified anger. As we saw it, our wrath was always justified. 
anger, <laughs> that occasional luxury of more balanced people, huh, could keep us on an emotional jag indefinitely. These emotional dry benders, which turned into the phrase dry drunks, often led straight to the bottle. Negative promise. Other kinds of disturbances, jealousy, envy, self-pity, and hurt pride, did the same thing. Hurt pride is dangerous. We've had our feelings hurt all of our lives, and maybe it's because we stuck our arm on our hip and that elbow was sticking out there, and that's where the feelings were, right there. Somebody even come near it. They hurt our feelings. It's pretty hard to hurt my feelings nowadays because of the habit of not reacting. Criticism is good because it makes me stop and think. I don't have to agree with it, but I have to stop and think about it. Just to not have somebody have that much influence over me when they really don't even mean to half the time. You know, I figure <laughs> people just uh, are not out to get me because they, <laughs> they're not thinking about me that often. <laughs> it's not worth their time to go out of their way to hurt my feelings. And sometimes it's a complete accident and it tells me, Willie, you're too far into yourself or you wouldn't have reacted. A spot check inventory taken in the midst, in the midst, right in the middle of such disturbances, can be a very great help in quieting stormy emotions. Today's spot check finds its chief application to situations which arise in each day's march. There's so much good. Uh, over on page 91, I'll hit that and we'll leave step 10, but it's so much good stuff. Take the time to read it. In all situations, we need self-restraint, honest analysis of what's involved, a willingness to admit when the fault is ours. It's so easy to just say, ooh, I blew it. You know, I screwed that up real good. No big, you know, you're not taking a character assassination on yourself because show me anyone that doesn't make a mistake. In our bracket, you know, we got people that are saints and things like that, but Bill's already, they've already told us we're not supposed to be saints. Because I, I, even with the sobriety that I have, I've never, I've reminded myself to never put on that halo. Because there's only a six inches between a halo and a noose. <laughs> and it's so good not to expect that just because I've been sober a little while, that everything is just going to go my way. A willingness to forgive when the false is elf, fault is elsewhere. We need not to be discouraged when we fall into the error of our old ways, for these disciplines are not easy. We shall look for progress, not for perfection. Our first objective will be the development of self-restraint. <coughs> this carries a top priority rating. When we speak or act hastily or rashly, the ability to be fair-minded and tolerant evaporates on the spot. One unkind tirade or one willful snap judgment can ruin our relations with another person for a whole day, maybe a whole year, and we know maybe a whole lifetime. Just one yuck. And I, I, that prospect just doesn't appeal to me of losing somebody, even if it wasn't somebody real near and dear, but for a lifetime, to every time I see them, know what I did. Don't want to... That's why you, you sidestep the, the fact of saying what you want to say, or when you want to say it. Nothing pays off like restraint of tongue and pen. We must avoid quick-tempered -temper criticism and furious power-driven argument. The same goes for sulking and silent scorn. We talked about that yesterday. You listening, girls? That old silent treatment. The old silent treatment is going to hurt you, honey, more than it's going to hurt you, you man. These are, because it says here, and it's true, these are emotional booby traps baited with pride, 
vengefulness, I'll get you. Our first job is to sidestep the trap. When we are tempted by the bait, we should train ourselves to step back and think. Man, that's, that's, a, that's a big order. For we can neither think nor act to good purpose until the habit of self-restraint has become automatic. These are goals to shoot for, hon. I've passed on this little prayer to a lot of people, and fortunately I have it written down here, so I always, because I got it in the Canadian language from a Canadian, and it's very, it was very different when he first handed it to me, and I used it that way, except it's harder for people to remember. But it simply says, he told me that, Willie, if you'll say this prayer every night, your life's going to be a lot easier. Say it and mean it. But you better wait two or three days if it, you, if I'm telling you this on Saturday, wait till Monday to try it. But he said your life will be, be better. God, let everyone tomorrow treat me as I treated them today. Are you signing up for something? Because you're asking God to do this, and he might do it. So it makes me more careful about how I live my today if I'm going to have to suffer some of the same stuff tomorrow. And see, I believe that when I pray to God, at least he takes it into consideration and he might do it if he has time. But I expect him to just treat me tomorrow and then go to sleep and know that, you know, you're going to be treated. Maybe it'll make you more cautious like you treated everybody that day. If you were ugly or put any un unhappiness into their lives, might want you tomorrow. And it's just good to have around. Uh, because, you know, most of the shadows in our life are created by standing in our own sunshine. And it's just a habit that we can get into. Step 11. Next page. Our principle is awareness. Of being aware, not only of our own faults, but being aware of in our own stuff that goes on in our lives, but being aware of everyone else's. To, to stop and consider for a moment if somebody else is having a little more trouble than you are, or even if equal trouble or a little less, but it isn't a good day for them, to be aware and be able to pick up on that. Someone that looks terribly sad when they usually, you know, don't look that way, just spend a few minutes with them and see if they can, if you can do one little thing of encouragement, Lord, you can say one thing that helps. Be aware of the misery around us, because it's there. We're not the only ones that wallow around in it. Other people do too. And to be aware of, to be, awareness makes you really hone in on your gratitude. For all the little things, we, we think, well, we'll wait and be, you know, grateful when we say our prayers tonight. But I walk around and if anything's happening, the other day I laugh, <laughs> and it isn't my age, now dad gum it, I laugh <laughs> in my house. I knew that blouse was in my house. I was looking for that thing. I couldn't find it anywhere. I had worn it about four months before, so I knew it was around. I knew it was in the house, but I couldn't find it. Four days. Every time I had a chance, I looked for that plane. In every closet I had clothes, in every suitcase that I packed various seasonal clothes, I looked everywhere for that blouse. I couldn't find it. And when I finally did, I just sat down in a chair, and I thought how silly it was afterwards, but I said, thank you, God. Because it wasn't the blouse. I didn't care about the blouse as much as the fact that I had misplaced it in my own house and couldn't find that thing. I thought, am I, you know, am I going into dementia here or what? Because I remembered that I put it up in a very special place. <laughs> It was special, all right. <laughs> Hanging on the ironing board, which was propped up. That's where I keep it most of the time. Propped up against the wall. 
and I had hung the thing for some reason on the back side of it instead of in the front where I could see it. Bright Willie, bright Willie, bright Willie. But I thought, here I am thanking God for, you know, I've gotten into such a habit of each little thing that goes along that, you know, turns around in good direction that I thank him for it. I thought, I know he's not up there fooling around with my blouse. <laughs> but I I couldn't help it. I've gotten into such a habit. It, it's it's rewarding because it, you get where it's so natural for you that it you'll get to my stage in life, I hope, that you live that long, that, you know, you'll have fewer and fewer things you think to be grateful for. I walk around being grateful that wrinkles don't hurt. <laughs> right. You'll get there, honey, if you live long enough. I don't care whether it might, Botox might be improved by then. I don't know. But the thing of it is, I've earned every one of them. I'm keeping every one of them. Every one of them, I can point to them, you know, set the mirror. Oh, I know where this one came from. I know where this one came from. Big deal. You know, I've been it's over 49 years. I don't know how I could tell anybody I was 39 years old. <laughs> Get my face all the wrinkles out of it and, and all that stuff. And, and you know, then accidentally say I taught school for 37 years. They, they have, you know, they can figure up. They don't need a computer. Okay. You know, prayer is, I have this jotted down here, is not a method of using God. It's just a, ma a matter of reporting for duty. And that's what our attitude during the day helps us. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only, only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. The only thing I told you all the other day that I prayed for it during my husband's long eight-year illness. It was just God help me this morning to have the strength today to do everything I can for my man. And that's all I could ask for it. And he did. I made it. But you can't stay sober on, you know, yesterday's spiritual experience. You have to keep renewing it. And that's one of the ways that you renew it, is turning to your higher power and in a practical way and just saying, you know, need some help here. Can't do it by myself. Don't want to do it by myself. To me, that turns out to be a big burden. But when I can turn something big like that was, not the crazy little stuff that I do with blouses and so forth and so on, but the big stuff. It says, prayer and meditation are our principal means of conscious contact with God. We AAs are active folks, enjoying the satisfaction of dealing with the realities of life, usually for the first time in our lives, and strenuously trying to help the next alcoholic who comes along. So it isn't surprising that we often tend to slight serious meditation and prayer as something not really necessary. To be sure, we feel it is something that might help us to meet an occasional emergency, but at first, many of us are apt to regard it as a somewhat mysterious skill of the clergyman from which we may hope to get a second-hand benefit. Or perhaps we don't believe in, it, in these things at all. But gratitude makes it real simple. Just to, to know that you're not responsible for each and everything that happens during your lifetime. So you don't have to turn and say, why did this happen to me? Okay, on page 97 over here, it says, Those of us who have come to make regular use of prayer would no more do without it than we would refuse air, food, and sunlight. And for the same reason, when we refuse air and light and food, the body suffers. When we refuse to turn away from meditation and prayer, we likewise deprive our minds our emotions, and our intuitions of virtually vitally needed support. As the body can fail its purpose for lack of nourishment, so can the soul. We all need the light of God's reality, the nourishment of His strength, and the atmosphere of His grace. To be, uh, to an amazing extent, the fact of AA life confirm 
this ageless truth. There is a direct linkage among self-examination, meditation, and prayer. Taken separately, these practices can bring much relief and benefit, but when they are logically interwoven as just a part of your breathing, the results is an unshakable foundation for life. What a promise, what a promise. And say life's going to be perfect. Just unshakable foundation. When the real trouble came, thanks for this program when it came into my life because it was just there like insurance. As we have seen, self-searching is the means by which we bring new vision, action and grace to bear upon the dark and negative sides of our nature. And we all have those dark negative sides. It's a step in the development of that kind of humility that makes it possible for us to receive God's help, yet it's only a step. We'll want to go further. We will want to the good that is in all of us, even in the worst of us, to flower and to grow. Most certainly we shall need bracing air and an abundance of food, but first we shall want sunlight. Nothing much can grow in the dark. Meditation is our step out into the sun. How then shall we meditate? Okay, we're going to have to skip over. How about turning to page 101, thinking about what just was said. Once more we read our prayer and again try to... That The in-between there is the prayer of St. Francis. And either you're familiar with it, if you're not, read it again and again. We again try to see what the its inner essence is. We'll think of now about the man who first uttered that prayer... First of all, he wanted to become a channel. Then he asked for grace to bring home love, forgiveness, harmony, truth, faith, light, hope, and joy to every human being he could. To just bring a little piece of that to anybody he met. Just a piece. Next came the expression of an aspiration and a hope for himself. See, it's okay for us to, to hope to be better people. Not that we're trying to get to be goody two-shoes, but just better people. He hoped, God willing, that he might be able to find some of these treasures himself. This he would try to do by what he called self-forgetting. What did he mean by self-forgetting, and how did he propose to accomplish that? He thought it better to give comfort than to receive it. Better to understand than to be understood. Better to forgive than to be forgiven. And I just made a point out of that by telling you all that, you know, it wasn't necessary for my man to understand my alcoholism. How could he? He had the ability all of his life to drink exactly how much he wanted and stop. You ever drink all you wanted after you got started? I never did. Sometime I was forced to stop, but it was painful. But see, I had no right. I was demanding that he understand <laughs> what a negative thing to do. When I gave it up, it changed my whole attitude. But it's just like, you know, a man lost a leg. And I tell him, I understand. And I'm standing in front of him on both my legs. There's no way I can understand that. I can, you know, wish him well, and is there any way I can help, and how about anything you need, I'll get it for you. But I understand, no, it's better for me to understand myself and to, to understand other people and how he might feel and what I might could do for him in that particular area than to, you know, to be forgiven myself and to be understood myself. So St. Francis was asking for qualities for himself, too, to make his life better. This much could be a fragment of what is called meditation, perhaps our very first attempt at a mood, a flyer into the realm of spirit, if you like. It ought to be followed by a good look at where we stand right now and a further look at what might happen in our lives were we able to move closer to the ideal that we have been trying to glimpse. Meditation is something 
which can always be further developed. But it has no boundaries, either of width or height. Just try it and see the feeling that comes over you. Just to, to look outward to, to, toward other folks and just try to see that what little thing, don't look for the big things. We don't necessarily have a, you know, a thousand bucks to hand somebody to get out of jail. That doesn't always happen. But when he gets home from jail, we can call him and, you know, say, well, glad you're back. At least we can do that. Little things. That's St. Francis' idea. You know, let me do that instead of being on the receiving end. Uh, I love this little thing that a preacher put in a bulletin one time. And it, it struck me as being so true. <clears throat> God was feeling depressed, so St. Peter was sent to earth in hopes of finding someone to cheer him up. Having heard of his coming, a large crowd was waiting to greet him, and, to t- uh, and from it one man, man ran, ran yelling, Take me, take me. I know just how to talk to God. I do it all the time. Lots of people talk to God, smiled St. Peter. What I'm looking for is somebody that will listen to him. And there's a great deal of difference. I've never heard a booming voice come down out of the sky. I've never heard that. But way, way down in here someplace, when I'm quiet enough and I'm really asking for a little guidance, I don't get the directions. Well, here's what you do, Willie. You go down and turn left and go three blocks and turn right. And <laughs> it's a feeling down here. If the answer isn't right there, that feeling is that the answer will come, Willie. Just put one foot in front of the other. Just wait. And sure enough, it is a such a elated feeling when sure enough it happens it comes to pass but just sometimes just listening we we ask God for things all the time but we uh, never stop to listen taking you know as the excuse that we're busy people we don't have time we just ask him for stuff and keep mo- keep it moving keep it moving we're going to have to go on to step 12 there's so much I hope y'all review the things that we've had to leave out They'll help, I guarantee it. Step 12, our uh, principle is service. Not necessarily big service up in New York or on your state level, but service to other people, to be available. All other people, not just our AA friends, as I mentioned before, Keep an ear out in the neighborhood where you live. If you live in an apartment building and you hear about somebody being real sick or something, see if there's some of the family you can help. Take the kids for a couple of hours. Get them out of the way. Get little, little stuff. That's service to mankind because it keeps you turning outward instead of inward, inward. And really gets bigger and bigger and bigger when I'm inside myself. But when I'm messing with you, then Willie's pretty well down to size. Having had a spiritual awakening as the results of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholic and to practice, practice these principles in all of our affairs. In this, in the, in the program, this is where I heard a. I had admitted in the beginning admitted that I was an alcoholic. I had accepted it along the way more and more and more. But here, practicing this twelfth step, doing what it asked me to try to do, is where I put my third A in the program. Approval. I approved at last of being an alcoholic and the advantages it gave me, not the disadvantages, but the advantages of being a part of all the people that I have met. Even if I didn't even have a conversation with them, I got to look at faces that are struggling against something that I struggle with, and some have it well on the way. Some of you just barely toddling so far. But just being a part of you has meant so much, and having this new way of life, 
This is where I added that third A, our proof of being an alcoholic. I can't think of a reason why, you know, even though once in a while it gets so thirsty you can't swallow. But the thing of it is, what are you thirsty for? It turns out that you're thirsty for more and more of what this program is trying to give you. I love this. The joy of living is the theme of AA's 12th step, and action is its key word. Here we turn outward towards our fellow alcoholics who are still in distress. Here we experience the kind of giving that asks no rewards. I had to sort of learn that the hard way. First couple of girls I got, I was trying, working with, they had the audacity to go out and get drunk on me. <laughs> Man, that upset me. I thought, you know, don't you realize how many hours I've spent talking to you and working with you and listening to all this stuff and, man, just, you know, how dare you go get drunk? Then I have to remember that that's what this says here. Here we experience the kind of giving that asks no rewards and ask, expecting her to stay sober with my great input <laughs> is wanting a reward. Here we begin to practice, practice all the 12 steps of the program in our daily lives so that we and those about us may find emotional sobriety. What a great gift we can give to the people we live with and live among. When the 12th step is seen in its full application, it's really talking about the kind of love that has no price tag on it. What a great kind of love. It's, it's very valuable when you get it. Why not believe that it's valuable when you give it away? The kind of living that has love that has no price tag on it doesn't mean that you always have to like me. I'm sure some of my girls get fed up with the same thing over and over and over. When I say my girls, I mean the ones I'm trying, sometimes trying very unsuccessfully, sometimes successfully, to help get into this life. But I always take it for granted, you know, there may be one little grain of something, even though they're out having a whooping law time now, there might be a grain of something they'll remember later on because that's the way it worked with me. Those men loved me sober by just putting up with me for four solid years. Because I went to my first AA meeting in 1953. But for four years, I fought this thing. I fought everything about it. So if that's what you're doing, hon, it, it, it's all right. Just don't fight too long. Because you may not have another drink in you or a drunk. The thing of it is, it, it's... It's a learning process, and if you hang around long enough, you're going to learn in spite of yourself. Because I'm still learning. I always want to stay green in this program, because green things grow. I hope I never get to the point where I think I really understand this this program and really get it all. I, I put my own needs into it, and that's what it's become. But I'm still... Every time we do one of these seminars, and, and I am a little bit sad because we've come here for 22 years, and it makes me a little sad, but not sad, and there's a difference. There's a difference, because I can look and see the, the value it has been every year I looked forward to coming here or doing the seminars, no matter we did them at hundreds of places, and and to look forward to going and sharing has been a, a real asset in my life. You know, when we get to this step, Bill said in a speech that he made out in San Francisco in the 40s, he said, better is the greatest, the word better is the greatest enemy of the word best. People come to AA and they quit drinking and they get better and they settle for that and don't ever get to be their very best. And that little thing has always meant a lot to me because I don't want to settle for understanding everything about this program. 
I'm just trying to to grow with it as I grow older, and don't resent growing older. I I don't want I will not I refuse to grow old. There's a lot of difference between those two words, old and older. Lord, I want to get older and older and older and older and older and older and older. And, older. and I don't have to get old. There's a lot of difference. I'm not a t- I don't have to go back to being a teeny bopper or any. I don't want to live my youth over again. Good Lord, help mercy. <sighs> Makes me tired to even think about it. But I want to enjoy each phase of my life and see how many phases I've gone through since the twenties and now. And I'm still 49, in case you're wondering what the now is. <laughs> Jaja Gabor once said, you know, any woman that'll tell her age will tell anything. <laughs> Jaja had it just right. This, there's a, a more, in, uh, on step 12 than any other, just like there is in the big book. Step 12 has a chapter all by itself. So it is important. Every phase of it. They talk about the, the not expecting any rewards for 12 step work. Uh, the next couple of pages are very valuable if you're working with somebody and want to sort of take those pages. All the step all the steps are listed, and they're sort of put in a little bit everyday more language. And it helps those brand new people. When I've helped a gal that went to school four or five, six years, but hadn't mastered the, the plan of reading yet, I can sit and go over these with her one by one, her with one book, me with the other, with our fingers pointed. We can go over these, and it helps her to to bring it down sort of into the world that she's in right then. And they're very, very valuable. Uh, hope you all take time to read them. Uh, on page 109, where it says, Now, what about the rest of the 12th step? The wonderful energy that it releases and the eager action by which it carries our message to the next suffering alcoholic and which finally trans lays the twelve steps into action upon all of our affairs is the payoff, the magnificent reality of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the best explanation I've ever seen, the magnificent reality, because we know what it is. We've had it here in this room day after day after day. I know you people are tired, and and but I hope there's a lot of saturation that took place. And then it'll, the cobwebs will clear. But the magnificent reality of people just pulling out of their regular lives and spending the time the whole weekend here. It's Father's Day. A lot of you men want to be home. For the first about 17 years of, of this seminar, I was here on Mother's Day. My son has a good sense of humor because I was determined to groom that as he... And he said, well, one thing about it, Mother, you've always been in Florida on Mother's Day for all these years. But shoot, I saved a lot of money because I didn't have to buy a present. (laughs) (laughs) On page 110. Practically every AA member declares that no satisfaction has been deeper and no joy greater than in 12-step work. Well done. To watch the eyes of men and women open with wonder as they move from darkness into light, to see their lives quickly fill with new purpose and meaning, to see whole families reassembled, to see the alcoholic outcast received back into his community in full citizenship, and above all, to watch these people awaken to the presence of a loving God in their lives. These things are the substance of which of what we receive as we carry AA's message to the next alcoholic. But here, hon, if you're new, be sure and, and, cause you see AA meetings on television and everybody has to do the same thing, you know. They get up, my name is so and so and I'm at their very first meeting. Let's, let's see what they say about this, about 12 step work. 
nor is this the only kind of 12-step work, working with individuals. We sit in AA meetings and we listen, not only to receive something ourselves, but to give the reassurance and support which our presence can bring. See, sometime when I get off of a long trip, I get home and, and I'll just sit in a meeting. It's good for me just to sit. Been blabbering since Thursday. So it's good for me to just sit. But I want to be there in case anybody needs that little reassurance that this program works. Year after year after year after year. That guarantee, we're the only guarantee that we can give these new people. It works. Through thick and thin, it works. Fair weather and foul. So just my presence there might add a little bit. Some, but uh, t- not only to receive something ourselves, but to give the reassurance and support which our presence can bring. If our turn comes to speak at a meeting, we again try to carry the AA message. Whether our audience is one or many, it's still 12-step work when we talk at a meeting. That's why we need to be careful about we, what we're talking about. Not our latest trip to the veterinarian with our dog and... <laughs> The other dog is by home in the kennel, and but I forgot to put his collar on him. And if he gets out, and so and so and so and so, and so, be careful. The you know the new people may not even have a dog. <laughs> so whether an audience is one or many, it, the, the impact of what we say and it had, doesn't have to be anything great. Just sharing all the goofy stuff that I share with y'all, or sometimes all that comes out of me at a meeting. Some of the little things that I've you know, just like wrinkles don't hurt. And if it's an elderly lady, well, then that helps her. So if we speak at meetings, uh, try to at least say something that, listen to what other people have said, and if there's somebody hurting, maybe you can even put in a little zinger that has helped you. It may help them. There are many opportunities, even for those of us who feel unable to speak at meetings or who are so situated that we cannot do much face-to-face 12-step work. And a lot of people are not able to go to 14 meetings in one day. I sponsor a little girl. She has five children under the age of 11. Yeah. I asked her if she knew what was causing it, but, you know, she didn't. <laughs> Most precious little bunch of young'uns you ever saw. They're just like little ducks. They'd follow her right along. But, see, she doesn't have a whole bunch of time to run to meetings. And that's for me to try to understand and tell her, you know, work with your husband, pick out one meeting a week. Maybe he'll keep those five kids if you don't take advantage of it and stay way late after the meeting. So, you know, make it... Got a problem? Try to solve it. But I didn't want her... You know, I didn't want anybody telling her either. I'm I'm sort of protective against with my gals or the girls I work with. Uh, I don't want anybody telling her, now, you're not going to be successful and you go to all these... There are eight meetings right around you. Go to one a day. Go to so many and so many length of time. Ah, uh-uh. and here are these ten little five five little ducks wandering around. What are they supposed to do? Hang on a nail someplace? No. <laughs> In Australia, when I was over there, the kids were allowed to come to meetings. You couldn't hear yourself think. They were all over the place. And and it disrupted an AA meeting, but that's all they could do, and so we just talk. I just talk louder. We can be the ones who take on the super uh, unspectacular but important tasks that make good 12-step work possible, perhaps arranging for coffee, cake after the meetings, where so many skeptical, suspicious newcomers have found confidence and comfort in the laughter and the talk. This is 12-step work in the very best sense of the word. Freely we you have received, freely give, is the core of this part of the twelfth step twelve. Okay, I got my warning from my best man over here. 
I want to leave you with two things. I hope I'll run into a whole bunch of you before it's all over with. You, we never know what's planned for us. I might even come back to Florida and just go from person to person and say hello. I might even, I might even. If Bill will let me hang his hat, you know, hang my hat where he lives, I'll go up to New York City. Okay, I want to leave you with these two things. One is applies to sort of the way we fit into the group and how we think about the group as a whole. Because if the groups fall under, we're going to fall. Without a group, we're, you know, nowhere. So think about this. This was in Grapevine. Next fall, when we are, uh, you see the geese heading south for the winter, flying along in a V formation, you might consider what science has discovered about why geese fly that way. It's been learned as each bird flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the bird immediately following. By flying in that V formation, the whole flock adds at least 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew alone. People who share a common sense of community can get where they're going quicker and easier because they are traveling on the uplift of one another. When a goose falls out of formation, it immediately feels the drag and resistance of trying to fly, go it alone and quickly gets back into formation to take advantage of the uplifting power of the bird immediately in front. If we have the much sense as a goose, we're going to stay in formation with those who are heading in the same direction that we're going. When you feel, when the lead goose gets tired, <laughs> as Charlie and I, we're, we're, you know, we're getting tired of the going, but when the lead goose gets tired, it rotates back in formation and another goose flies point. It pays to take turns doing the hard jobs. Geese honk from behind you know, to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. And we too do something when we honk from behind. Finally, now, and I want to get this. When a goose gets sick or is wounded by gunshots and falls out, two geese fall out of formation and follow it down to help and protect it. They stay with their ailing goose until it's either able to fly or until it dies. They launch out on their own with another group formation to catch up only then with their group. If we have the simple sense of a goose, we're going to stand by each other that way. So y'all stand by me in your thoughts. Love you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.